When it comes to distinctive newspaper designs, the print edition of the Financial Times stands out. The 135-year-old publication is instantly recognizable for its salmon pink paper, and it's become a status symbol for London's moneyed elite. The newspaper's web presence is extremely successful as well. In early 2022, it announced it surpassed 1 million digital subscribers, an especially impressive feat given its hefty price tag of over $400 a year. So given this success, why did the Financial Times launch a mobile app last year that only costs around £5 a month? To answer this question, I turn to Malcolm Moore, a longtime Financial Times editor who was put in charge of FT Edit, which is the name of the new mobile app. We discussed why he was chosen to lead the initiative, what the app has to offer that differs from the main newspaper, and who the audience is for the product. Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and this is The Business of Content, the show about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. If you'd like to listen to an audio version of this show, subscribe to The Business of Content wherever you get your podcasts. Oh, one more thing. When we recorded the interview, FT Edit hadn't yet launched a U.S. version of the app. Since then, it's hired an American editor, and U.S. downloads overtook U.K. downloads in January. Okay, let's jump into my interview with Malcolm. Hey, Malcolm, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So we're here to talk about this uh, amazing app that you are the editor of. Before, let's give a little bit of background of your experience, your expertise, and uh, your work at the Financial Times. So you have a deep background in UK journalism, and you actually worked as a foreign correspondent in, a, in multiple countries, right? Right. So um, I spent most of my career overseas. Um, I was in Italy, uh, based in Rome for four years. And then I was in China, uh, based both in Shanghai and in Beijing for another eight years. And then I came back to the UK at the beginning of 2015. uh, And I've been at the FT ever since then. And did you did you learn like Italian and and Mandarin and all that while you were, you know, did you go do that standard thing as the foreign correspondent? I, I absolutely did, yeah. So um, Italian, I went to a university in Perugia um, for several months uh, before I started work. But my first interview was actually with Silvio Berlusconi uh-huh. uh, after he lost the 2000 and, must be 2005 election. Um, so uh, yeah, it was a sort of baptism of fire. And then in China, yeah, I studied Mandarin every morning for you know two or three hours um, for very many years. And is that the standard, like, I don't know what it's like to be a financial court or a uh, foreign correspondent. Is that what they, any time that you're being sent, if you're working at the New York Times or whatever, and you're being sent overseas, like, are are they looking for native speakers or are they just like, we're going to enroll you in language classes and you're going to have to learn in real time? So, um, actually, um, so I was at a different newspaper back then. I wasn't the FT. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I have a sneaking suspicion that when they sent me to China, they thought I was a native Chinese speaker <laughs> because I am ethnically half Chinese. Oh, okay. uh, just I grew up, I'm half Singaporean, but I grew up overseas and I never learned Chinese for various reasons. Uh, but I think they thought that I, that I could. I mean, ideally, if you're picking a foreign correspondent, you obviously want somebody who is a native speaker in the language. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. Failing that, um, you know, you can you can you know hire someone and hope that they can get up to scratch in the language as quickly as possible. And they just never they never ma- uh, bothered to ask you if you knew the language. <laughs> um, by the time they asked me, they'd already offered me the job. So yeah, and <laughs> I got now, lucky. Yeah, as you know, China has become a greater and greater financial superpower. Has that you know that knowledge in, uh, of Mandarin has that helped you at all, or has that been relevant to your to your work? So I would say that actually it's, it's, it's very difficult to um, really understand what is going on in China at this moment if, uh, for a variety of reasons. The first is, of course, the Chinese language media is um, largely state controlled one way or the other. Um, the second is that um, it's been very difficult to be a foreign correspondent in China um, over the COVID period. Um, lots of correspondents have gone outside of the country. There are only a few left. Um, of course, a lot of American correspondents were expelled from China um, before COVID and during. So it's, I think, you know, we're at a, we're at a sort of pretty, pretty difficult point in time where actually understanding what's happening in China is more important than ever and also more difficult than ever. And when and how did you make the transition from being a reporter to an editor? <laughs> um, 
Yes, well, so I joined the FT um, to, and I became what we call the leisure industries correspondent. I was covering sport or the business of sport, so I covered the collapse of FIFA and I interviewed Sepp Blatter, the then head of FIFA, and I was having a lot of fun. And then uh, my bosses came to me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, um, we need a new person to run our national desk, our UK news desk. And, um, you know, this thing called Brexit is about to happen. And we just want, you know, we want a new person to steer through all of it. And I said, oh, OK, yeah, that sounds like a great opportunity. And I took it. But, um, uh, yeah, it was a lot of work. It was three years of very intense political coverage. There's this, um, there are like this theory within journalism that there are natural born editors, but then there's also a lot of great reporters who get promoted into being bad editors. <laughs> did you feel, did it feel like more of a natural fit to be an editor versus a, versus a correspondent? <laughs> what an awful question, Simon. How can you possibly ask me that? Um, I, I wasn't assuming I, that you were in the latter. I was assuming <laughs> that you were in the former category. Do you know, I absolutely love being a reporter. And I think we all got into journalism to be reporters, right? And I think that, and, and definitely here at the FT, reporters have by far the most fun because, you know, they can go out and achieve some amazing things and do some incredible coverage. And, and I will always miss that. However, I will also say that, that, you know, I think everybody who gets into journalism should try both sides because you really need to understand how both sides of the equation work. Uh, and, and, you know, if you're a great reporter, but you have no understanding of the editing process and its demands, you're not going to be as good a reporter as you could be. Ditto if you're an editor and you've never been a reporter and, you, you, you know, you've, you, you don't know what it feels like to be, you know, in a war zone or at a disaster area or on a very tight deadline racing to beat your competitors and, you know, to be able to deal with those reporters in an empathetic way. If you don't know how to do that, you're never going to be a great editor either. Yeah. And um, did you have to like grow new muscles? Because I feel like I'm a I'm a competent writer, but like I feel like if you put a bad piece of copy in front of me, I wouldn't know how to fix it. Like that's like a muscle I don't have. Oh, no, I'm, I'm afraid that I've always been the sort of person who really wants to interfere with other people's copy. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I had that muscle. I just didn't know it was there. But actually, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite good at thinking about structure and, and, and I really enjoyed that part of the process. I, I would say the most satisfying thing about being an editor is seeing a draft of a story that is good but not great and then helping the reporter unlock it to be that really great piece of work that goes on to win awards and, you know, everybody loves and, you know, does, does incredibly well, makes a difference. So you've worked your way up in the Financial Times and have edited various verticals. Can you kind of like for my American readers, can you contextualize the Financial Times role in journalism? Like it's, it's basically the equivalent of like a Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg News. Like it hires some of the best financial journalists in all of Europe. Um, that's right. I mean, we're an analog for the Wall Street Journal here in Europe. Um, uh, I can't remember exactly how old we are now. We're 130 years old, maybe a bit older than that. Um, we, you know, but but as well as covering business and, and as what, you know, I know this is also applies to the journal, we have invested significantly in foreign reporting. We have an amazing network of, of bureaus across the world. We've got a, more, more than 150 journalists, our foreign correspondents here at the Financial Times. Um, we have fantastic science reporting. We basically, you know, we're not just trying to write about finance despite our name, mm -hmm. we're trying to write, uh, we're trying to give our readers the information they need to make informed decisions about their business. And but that being said, you probably over index on billionaire readers compared to the average UK publication. And you have your, uh, your the print version is, is famously salmon pink. And it's kind of a status symbol to have that under your arm, right in London. Yeah, absolutely. If you work in the city and you're not uh, the city of London being the financial district, if you work in the city and you are not carrying the Financial Times around or reading it on your phone, then um, I'm sure your peers will treat you with very little respect. Yeah. And so uh, it's also famous for having an extremely hard paywall. Um, it doesn't meter its stories. How much does an annual subscription like digital subscription cost to the Financial Times? Um, so actually, I don't have the dollar figure in front of me. 
Um, I but actually, dollars and pounds are almost the same these yeah, days. So yeah. it's between three hundred fifty and four hundred dollars a year. I yeah, think. that's about what a Bloomberg subscription or a Wall Street Journal subscription. So right. it's definitely quite expensive. Um, you know, a lot of people who use it, they're either wealthy or they can expense it to their accounts. Right. Um, and it, it recently surpassed one million digital subscribers. When when did that happen? Yeah. Um, that was a few years ago now, maybe two, three. I think we've got about 1.3, 1.4 at the moment. Yeah, and there's only really a handful of newspapers all across at least the Western world that have reached uh, that number. You know, in the United States, you basically have the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and the New York Times, and I don't think there are many others. So it's definitely a very, um, a very elite uh, membership that it has in the 1 million subscription club. But like I said, it's $400. There are a lot of people who can't afford that. Uh, so that's, that kind of brings us to what we're talking about today is that this this new product that you have been tapped to edit. When did uh, senior management start discussing launching a less expensive product? Like what was the motivation behind it? Right. So, I mean, I think just, just, just to say, you know, we were one of the first newspapers to have a very hard paywall. And we've had it for very a very long time, and it has worked really well for us. The Financial Times business model is really robust. Uh, we have a great owner as well, the Japanese uh, uh, financial newspaper Nikkei owns us. But but basically, this is this has been a newspaper. The reason I came here, and and a lot of the great journalists here came here, is because whilst the rest of the British media was looking for a new business model, the FT was stable, was hiring great people, was being really ambitious about its journalism, and that was all funded by, as you say, this expensive paywall. And so we've always been really nervous about anything that would hurt that business model. But I think during the pandemic, we saw a different kind of reader come to our website, and we saw a huge number of them. So we we, we saw... Uh, you know, millions and millions of readers come to us primarily for our coverage of the pandemic. And we thought that was for a couple of reasons. One is we have great science reporting and we were, you know, and we've also got fantastic data journalism and people were coming to us to see um, the the charts and graphs that we were putting together about, you know, um, uh, excess mortality in all sorts of different locations and really for that sort of global comparison uh, between countries, a lot of a lot of newspapers were looking at you know what's happening in the UK. We are always thinking globally. So, yeah, you know, I remember there was at... like a chart that was going viral on Twitter like every single right. day because it was right. like updating in real time, comparing right. all the different countries and their mortality rates and stuff like that. Right. So, so I think, um, and the other reason is because we're kind of politically neutral, right? We're not we're not right wing. We're not left wing. You know, we look at everything through the prism of money, which gives us a sort of neutrality in a way. Um, and and the board looked at the, that that emerging group of readers and thought, okay, is that an audience for us? We do have all this fantastic stuff that we invest in. What can we offer to them at a lower price point that um, uh, will not harm our main business? And so that's really when we started exploring it. And we explored all sorts of different ideas. Right, we explored subscriptions to just an individual vertical. We explored metered access to the website. We explored like a lot of people here in the UK. They buy the print edition of FT Weekend, which has a lot more arts and culture and and you know less less businessy stuff in it. And so we thought, well, maybe there's an audience just for FT Weekend stuff. Uh, we we looked at everything basically, um, and what we settled on was that we that we wanted to try and launch an app. Um, that would be separate from the main product and that the app would try and solve a few problems that we saw coming up over and over again in user surveys. Mm -hmm. The first of those problems and the biggest one was um, a lack of in-depth analysis. So people felt that they were consuming a lot of news but that they didn't understand it or they didn't get what was driving it or what was behind it. And actually that suits us quite well. You know, we have a lot of in-depth analysis. The second problem uh, is that uh, a lot of people felt overwhelmed, like that there was too much news, that they were that they they didn't want to read five hundred articles, they didn't want to doom scroll all day, they wanted in a way more curation. Somebody to say, if you're just going to read one thing today, make it this piece. This piece will explain to you everything about this subject that's in the news cycle, and that's really what we built the app around the, those two things, right? To try and create something that was less overwhelming, 
that was kind of daily edition uh, and something that uh, was full of in-depth explanatory journalism. What's your sense of the like the consumer desire for uh, news apps? Like, I feel like back when the iPad launched, every single publisher was jumping in on it. Everybody, like, they thought the genie was going back in the bottle. This was going to bring back like the print, the trade the the pennies for dollars back to you know all that kind of stuff. But I feel like today a lot of publishers don't even bother with yeah. a with a mobile app. What's your kind of a uh, sense of like what the consumer demand is there? So, so you're absolutely right. Like there was a peak and then there was a trough. I would say the trough followed um, the New York Times Now app, right? So that's famously the example of a news organization that went out, tried to do something different and innovative, and then eventually abandoned the idea. Um, and as we looked at the competition, you know that 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 you know other publishers after the New York Times um, had that um, experiment. Most other publishers have stuck to their knitting, as it were. They've, they've stuck to their main product. Everybody's got an app, but it's basically the main product. There are very few organizations that have launched a separate standalone app with a different subscription from their main one. Uh, the New York Times, of course, being one of them with cooking. Um, uh, but but in terms of like a news standalone product, there are there's, there's a handful of them out there. The Washington Post has one, I think. Um, Le Monde has one. Um, but it's very difficult to know. Has one, oh right? yes, the Economist has one. Um, uh, but but aside from those three, there aren't that many out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and of and course, so, the FT the FT okay. didn't. You know, we had our, our main app. Our main app is now over ten years old. Yeah. And and we didn't want to add an extra app uh, until now. Yeah. And so, was the motivation was that like you could charge money but less money for this? And generate additional revenue, or was it for having broader impact? Because obviously, journalists think about how accessible their journalism is. Like, what's the kind of thinking? Is this is this mainly a business move? Um, look, I, I, the way I would frame it is, you know, as we look forward, right? One of the reasons that I think until now, lots of publishers haven't done apps is because um, the majority of their traffic was coming to their website. Right, but we're now moving into a generation where the majority of traffic is mobile, mm-hmm. uh, and and looking ahead, it's only going to get more entrenched. And if the majority of your traffic is mobile on smartphones, don't you want to have a little piece of real estate on the smartphone home screen? Right, you don't want to rely on everybody going to the browser every time and typing in your website URL and then providing a mobile version of your website. Right, you, you you want to have to build that habit and connection with your audience and have a little app. And the other reason, of course, is that you know um, uh, you want to be learning more about your audience. And you know, with the death of cookies and everything else, you want to probably think about asking your audience for more first-party data. And so you need a, a, like a deeper relationship than maybe the everyday browser relationship that, that most people currently have. So I think that's one of the things. We, we hadn't built an app for a long time. We wanted to have a deeper relationship with this new potential audience, and we wanted to learn the skills that we need to know in order to operate in this world. So there's a bit of future-proofing going on. The second thing is it does give us a separate uh, sort of sandbox, if you like, in which we can experiment with a bunch of ideas that we can't use on the main product. So, like, there are lots of practical reasons for doing it. And then on top of all of that, you know, we hope that this will be an attractive standalone business. Um, You know, uh, uh, I think we can reach a different audience in a different way through this. And that's what we're, we're seeing as well. At the beginning, we were very worried about cannibalization and the impact on the main product. We're now so relaxed about it that... Um, FD Edit, which is the name of the app, is on our main subscription page as an option. So it's right up there next to the you know, $350, $400 option. It's there and it's not having any, any impact at the moment on the people who are choosing the more expensive option. And how did you get tapped to run this? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't really know. Um, so my job before this was that I was asked to set up a new vertical for the FT um, covering technology. So I basically set up a technology vertical, we staffed it up, we have 20 journalists, more than 20 journalists worldwide working on it. And I think 
maybe the bosses felt that, you know, it, I was thinking about technology a lot. I was bringing ideas that I had found at tech companies into the editorial floor and talking to people about like, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? So maybe I was the sort of person who would be interested in this kind of puzzle. And so what kind of team did you assemble and how did you go about brainstorming how the app would look and, and what it would do and how did you start building it? So um, I should say that I didn't put together the team. I'm simply the editorial uh, representative on the team. Mm -hmm. uh, but we put together a team across um, all the major parts of our business. So uh, representatives from product and commercial and, and, and um, data and all sorts of people were there. And what it actually started before I came on board, you know, it started off, it grew out of that initial several months of research in the US about what people said they wanted. Right. So we did a lot of user research and we tried to um, define an audience that we could sell this app to. I came on board at the point where we were uh, we had decided it was going to be an app and where we're thinking about functionality and what it, what it needed and also about approach. Um, because, again, we hadn't done this for a long time. And um, from an editorial point of view, I think journalists are always thinking about cool new features that they can put into an app, right? Like, oh, let's make it do this. Oh, what can, can we make it do that? And actually, I got a lot of pushback from the product guys who were very sort of tech about it. They were like, no, 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 it's a minimum viable product. We put out, you know, the barest bones thing that we can, and then we iterate and we evolve it based on data. And that's how we do things. And we don't do things because you think it's a good idea, Malcolm. We do things because, you know, our users say they need them. It's like, oh, OK, well, I, I understand. Fine. Um, but, you know, I'm an open minded kind of guy, so I bought into that. Um, and that's how it's been. So we designed something. Uh, which we thought was a simple, you know, in line with the idea that we wanted it to be a relaxing experience, something that wouldn't, you know, when we asked people how they felt about the news, a lot of people said that the news made them feel anxious. And when and um, there's an annual survey done by the Reuters Institute here in Oxford, uh, but it's a global survey uh, of of you know attitudes to journalism throughout the world. And this year, they identified this new, new, well, not new, but growing segment of people. When asked, what news do you consume? They said, we actively try to avoid the news, right? And I think in the US, it was 9% of people said that last year. And this year, it's 13%, which is quite a strong rise. And, and they feel that the trend is growing. And it's not just in the US, in a lot of other countries, People say, I actively try to avoid the news. The news makes me feel anxious. You know, I prefer to look at maybe entertainment on my phone or, you know, stream something or just, I just don't want to, I just don't want to read the news. So in a sense, we thought about why that was. And we felt, you know, one of the things about newspaper websites is that they are, and, and indeed about uh, TV news, is that it's just constantly updating right you can never be on top of it in the old days you would read your newspaper in the morning and then you wouldn't have to think about the news for the rest of the day until the following morning but now you sort of feel like you have to click back to the website every you know 20 minutes just in case there's a new development and it's that habit of like forcing your readers to keep coming back keep coming back what's the latest what's the latest we were trying to get away from that we were actually trying to get back to the idea of just read something good, read one good thing a day. If you read one good thing a day and you learn from it, you take away from it and you can share it with your friends and family, that's actually a satisfying experience. Um, you know, it's the sort of thing where you have a cup of coffee and you sit down, you want to learn more about the world, educate yourself and, and then come away from it with something that you can have a conversation with someone about. Yeah, and I think that's the philosophy that a lot of these daily newsletters like Morning Brew right. or like the local newsletters like Axios, DC, right. they do the same thing is like a lot of people feel guilty that they're not reading more local news, but it is overwhelming. But they feel like if they could just open up this one newsletter a day, read it for five minutes, they feel like they, right. they're up to date on what's going on in their city or right. whatever. Right. They can close it and get a, get a lot – get go on with the rest of their day. So it's kind of embracing yeah. that same kind of philosophy. Absolutely. The problem with my inbox, of course, is there are now 200 newsletters in it, including yours. You yeah. Know, and, and how do you get through them all? But, yeah, but it's taken me like two hours a day now to get through <laughs> them all. It's, it's getting bad. But how that translated into our design was 
we thought, okay, the first thing is everybody does a vertical scroll, right? Almost every app out there is a vertical scroll that encourages users to keep scrolling. It never ends. It's an endless scroll, the Instagram scroll uh, or the Twitter scroll. We have replaced that with a horizontal carousel. Yeah, so, so they're, so they're like a carousel, yeah. Almost like Instagram stories or something like that. Right. There are eight stories a day. You flick across them, and then when you hit the end, there's a card there at the end that says, this is the end. You have finished. Yeah. More stories coming tomorrow, right? So yeah. that gives you permission to feel like you're done. The other thing is we thought about being, you know, whether we should let people swipe from story to story when we're in the story or when they're in the story, and we actually have stopped that. If you go into a story, you have to come back out of the story and then go on to the next. So we made a load of these choices, which were an attempt to deliberately slow readers down, make sure that they were paying attention to what they were reading. Uh, we stripped out all the ads. We stripped out all the furniture. Like there's, there's very little in the story itself apart from the picture and the text. Uh, you know, there are no breaks, there's nothing else. We, we, we just wanted, we want to look as clean and as minimal and as focused as possible. Uh, and actually, you know, our users have come back to us here in the UK and said that this is something they really appreciate and it's really worked for them. So we're, we're happy it's kind of communicated it well, itself well. How big of an editorial team do you have? Um, very small, but my bosses keep saying um, it's already too big no I'm only, I'm only kidding um we're, we're trying to add but uh, uh so um uh the curation of the app is done by me and a deputy and then we have a data analyst who um basically is helping us to spot trends and and you know decide on on how we evolve the app but the data analyst also works for product and and marketing as well it's not just ours but he sits with us and then we have a researcher, which is a sort of entry-level position. And the idea behind that was, can we repurpose some of the evergreen stuff in the FD archive and bring it back to life? So, for example, when we were all very depressed early in the year, we asked him to put together like five great science stories. So we, we basically had a story called Five Scientific Breakthroughs to Cheer You Up. And it was about five things that we've discovered this year that, you know, give us some hope amid all the climate catastrophe and war in Ukraine and, you know, financial markets tanking and everything else. So the product you eventually launch is called FT Edit. Uh, you launch it in the UK mainly. And well, at least that's where you market it. Um, when did you launch it? So we launched in the UK six months ago, so in March. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the deal was basically it was free for the first month and you didn't have to register. We didn't collect any data. We didn't do anything. You basically just, if you downloaded it, you could just start reading straight away for free. And then after a month, we were asking people to pay 99p a month, which you know, again, is significantly cheaper than the cover price of the FT, especially to get like eight of our best uh, articles every day. And then uh, after six months, we are still thinking about the price point, but it hasn't actually quite kicked in yet. We think it'll be £4.99 a month, uh, but, you know, it could change according to demand. And so there are eight stories a day, right? And it's, it's like right. the eight, it's the same eight for everybody? It's the same eight for everybody right now. Uh -huh. um, so talk so talk about that like what's your kind of daily process in terms of figuring out what those eight stories are because it's not financial news primarily that you're featuring in the app right so I mean I think um, the first thing to say is that a lot of our readers here in the UK have come to us and said why are you picking the stories we want to pick the stories so there's been that sort of push for something that's a bit more personalized but an equal number, if not a greater number of people have come to us and said, actually, we really like a curated product. We really wanted somebody to pick the stuff for us. Uh, and so we're still thinking about that tension now. Like, mm -hmm. what, should the, what should the balance be between curation and personalization? In terms of how we pick it, uh, the first thing we do is we are only picking in-depth analysis and opinion and features. So we're not including any breaking news coverage in our app. So it's almost like a magazine in some ways. We, we expect that our readers are getting their news from somewhere else, that they already have a subscription to another newspaper or they're watching the TV or here in the UK looking at the BBC website, which is you know by far the biggest news website in the UK. Uh, the reason they're coming to us is for that additional layer of insight and opinion and understanding. And so that's the first thing we're asking. We're like, 
of everything that's been out there today, not just in the FT, but in in our rivals and in you know on Twitter and elsewhere, is this article? Does it have the extra bit of insight that you can't get anywhere else? So I think that's the first filter that we apply. After that, uh, we're basically at the beginning of the app. We're trying to keep it quite tightly tied to the news cycle. So this will help you understand what is going on in the news. But as it progresses through the eight stories, we're, we're moving from stuff that's really tied to the news cycle to our best opinion writers who have um, uh, regular slots in the app so that you know that they're going to be there on, on, the, on any given day of the week, uh, on the day of the week that they usually are. And then as you get back to the end of the app, at the end of the eight stories, we're picking stories from FT Weekend, which is, again, something a little bit lighter, maybe some travel, maybe some food, maybe some art, maybe some music, maybe some theatre, you know, that kind of stuff. Book reviews, that makes it uh, towards the end. Something, something basically to kind of leaven, leaven the mix a little bit. Um, and, yeah. and sorry, just to say one final thing that, that has played really well with our readers and it's of course something that we have expertise in, is stuff about how to manage your career, how to manage your money, how to navigate the cost of living crisis, you know, that kind of stuff um, has done really well for us. And in terms of like how your own day is structured, when are you, when are you actually making these choices and putting, because it, it gets sent out I think at 5 a.m. every morning. Okay. Right. What, when are you actually like compiling all that, the, what's going to go out in the edition of that day? So um, we basically have a long list of stuff that we're adding to all the time. And then we actually start to whittle it down over the course of the day, building up to, you know, the sort of evening deadline. And that actually, um, you know, one thing that's very helpful is that the FT itself, we switched um, a few years ago. Uh, when we realized basically that most people read the FT, uh, our website at 5 a.m., that's our peak reading time for the website here in the UK, and indeed 5 a.m. US time is our peak reading time in the US. When we realized that, we thought, oh, we would better put our best stuff up online at 5 a.m. So actually the FT itself publishes all of our best stories uh, at 5 a.m. in the morning, and our afternoon news conference here is to decide the following morning's uh, homepage. Mm -hmm. So... It's usually after that news conference that my team will have a final huddle, put together the final lists, uh, and then get ready to send it out. And then I think in the app you can you can actually go through the archive. So there's a there's not just the eight stories a day, and because these are so, somewhat more evergreen, you could technically get some value of going through previous editions and getting to read all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so you can you can read basically a week's worth of of editions in the app. Uh, but then if you save stuff, you, it's saved, you know, indefinitely. Um, but the app only holds it for about a week. Uh, okay. And then how are you driving? So you launched in in spring, right? Yeah. And how are you driving downloads of the app? Like you mentioned, it's on the subscriptions page. What, what other strategies are you using to grow the audience? So, uh, again, this is all stuff that we're learning as we go. So... Um, uh, initially, we basically put together a paid media plan which revolved around Apple search ads and Google search ads, um, but uh, it wasn't hugely effective for us, um, and we suspended it, mostly because we couldn't get the tech on our side working to be able to do any tracking on those ads, so we paused it for a little bit, and we're now coming back uh, with a... Uh, with a sort of multi-channel marketing plan. Um, again, this is kind of not my area of expertise or responsibility, but we're going to do, be doing some influencer marketing. We're going to be doing a bunch of stuff across uh, so our social, um, both in terms of our own media, but also um, we'll be, I think, paying for some social and we're doing more search ads. We're optimizing our App Store page um, to make it look better. And uh, what else are we doing? Seems um, like promotions within the daily newsletters would be big. Yeah, sorry. So we, we, we have both promotions in the newsletters and in the podcasts. Yeah. Basically, across all of our own channels, we've got various bits of promotion going on. Because you've got hugely successful free podcasts at the Financial yeah. Times. Yeah. And we're also targeting lapsed subscribers. So people who have handed back in their FT uh, subscription. Funnily enough, 
a large group of people hand back their FT subscriptions, or maybe not a large group, but certainly some people have handed it back. And when we've asked them, why have you quit your subscription? They've said stuff like, I love the FT. I read it every day. But, but honestly, you guys are producing 200 articles a day and I can't read enough of it to get value for money. So uh, this idea of like, you have to be consuming a lot to justify the amount you're spending on the subscription. So anyway, lap subscribers are one group who we're saying, okay, like you don't have enough time for the full FT. Why don't you try this? See if this suits you better. Do you give, the, what about like giving the app for free to already existing financial time subscribers? Do you do anything like that? Yeah, so if you are an existing subscriber, you can simply use your FT credentials to log into the app. And so we do, we do have, you know, a segment of our of our audience who are uh, existing FT subscribers. And we're actually trying to work out right now how they behave with both of them. But existing FT subscribers who, again, want an extra level of curation. And, th- and that has come out in, in survey after survey. It's people who are like, I love, I love reading the news, but I look at the homepage and there's just too much stuff there. And I just want somebody to tell me, like, this is the must read. Read this one. So you, so in terms of like business success, it's not just about how many new subscribers you have, but if you can create additional benefits to make the, the main subscription stickier and lower retention, then that's also considered a win. I mean, it would be a huge win if we actually managed to convert people from the FD edit upwards. But no, I no, think I'm we, saying as, yeah, a, no, as, as a retention tool. As a retention tool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that would also be a win. I mean, I think there are all sorts of possible positive things that have come out of it and are coming out of it. Um, but I think internally, you know, we started off uh, the beginning of this year with with basically a standard subscription and a premium subscription. And those were our only two price points and they were both very expensive. We're now thinking actually about, you know, how do you create a, a, a lot of different entry points to the FT for different audiences? And how are you turning it into a daily habit? Is it mainly through push notifications? And if so, how are you strategizing around push notifications? So um, we, again, the premise of our app is that we're not going to, you know, we're not going to be too pushy. We're not going to bombard you. We don't, everybody, everybody gets a lot of push notifications. We want to be very careful because this is an app that is designed for, for, you know, to sort of take you, you know, not to give you that anxious feeling about the news, as it were. Um, and to encourage focus reading. So we've started with two push notifications. We might actually go down, I don't know. But we basically are trying to send them at times when you might be more relaxed anyway. So we send them, uh, we, we send them at 11 o'clock, around about just before lunch, uh, the UK time. And then we send another one called Bedtime Story um, at about 7 p.m., 8 p.m., we started sending that one because we saw that that was actually one of the spikes in our in in read it in the time that readers were coming to us. So we thought, oh, we'll just give them a, a little reason to come to us. Um, that one's been both of them have been pretty successful, I would say, and we can see um, that the articles that we're pushing get a lot more engagement, and they are bringing people back every day. That's one tool. Uh, I think the other tool. Well, which are I'm, you are you like? Is it just something like a generic message, like your daily edition is oh, ready, no, or no, is no. it like an actual specific no, no, story? No, no, no. So it's supposed to be uh, what it, what we're what we're aiming for is that feeling of your friend calling you up and saying, "I've just read this. You should read this. Right? This is great. You should read this." It's it's you know. If I look, I looked at the other FT push notifications, and they're all things like you know, breaking news, um, you know, Russia invades Ukraine or whatever it is. And I think we wanted to get people thinking, okay, you know, ours are, ours are a bit chattier; they're much more casual. Um, you know, you can tell just by the title of you know, it pops up in your screen and says bedtime story. Yeah, how about this? This is something quirky that you may not have thought about during the day, but it'll be fun to read and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, and ditto for the morning one. We're trying to keep them quite short and snappy. But with that sense that it's a sort of trusted recommendation from, you know, someone who has your best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about like a corresponding like daily newsletter where it's the same things, but then you click on it and it opens in the app and different stuff like that? We absolutely thought about that. Um, uh, The way that we thought about it was though, so the first thing is we're not collecting any emails or registration until a month in right so the paywall pops up after a month 
And that's the first time that you have to enter your credentials. Uh, and actually, we don't have a problem with retention. Uh, you know, actually, we see quite high engagement. We have a very low churn rate. I think our churn rate is 5% or lower. So we're not actually having a problem with retaining people and they're spending a lot of time on our app. The way that we thought about it is once people are a month in, how many of them are going to sign up for the newsletter? And then of the newsletter, how many of them are going to open the newsletter? And we just decided that at the beginning, it probably didn't make sense as a retention tool because it's just too small of a proportion of people. Um, but maybe further along the line, we might do that. Um, so like, what other kind of bells and whistles do you think you could add to it to make it stickier? My first thought is, you know, since it's only eight stories a day, you could have a professional voice actor read all these stories so that if people wanted to just listen to all eight stories, they could. What are some of your, are there, there could be community aspects, uh, you know, where people can comment or discuss. What are your thoughts about different things you could pull into the app to make it uh, like, obviously you don't want it to be overloading, like the simplicity is part of the, part yeah. of the, you know, design of it, but what are you thinking in terms of next generation version of the, of the product? So we are two things that we're focusing on the, on at the moment. The first is we're preparing to do a launch in the U S and so we're trying to come up with a U.S. edition that really suits the U S market. The second thing is we are actually redesigning the homepage right now, and hopefully that will be ready for U S launch. And we're building all sorts of, I mean, some of those things you mentioned, but I think the way that we're thinking about it is, you know, what can we do? Uh, okay, well, actually, the, 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 uh, there's been a very positive response to the app, but the issues that people have identified have been revolving a little bit around curation, which is, you know, who is picking these articles? How do I trust you to pick these articles for me? Um, you know, why can't I pick my own articles? That's a, that's a slightly separate one. But but if you're going to pick them for me, I need to know more about you and more about your process. So in our next iteration, we're going to try to explain ourselves a little bit more and probably show ourselves a little bit more. So at the moment, we're doing one article a week at the weekend where we're sort of saying, here's the thing that I liked the most this week. And here's what I thought the big story was this week. And here's what, you, you know, here's a great podcast that I enjoyed. Why don't you listen to this? So like a little a little more of a sort of behind the scenes. Sometimes we'll go off and interview a reporter about one of the stories that they've done that's been very popular on the app, and he'll talk, he or she will talk about how they reported it, why they reported it, what they couldn't keep in the story, like what got left on the cutting room floor, that kind of thing. So I think behind the scenes look at the newsroom. People have responded to that very well. So we may do a little bit more of that. We may try and do it on a daily basis. Um, you know, we may say, Here's the big story of the day, you know, to try and get people into the habit of coming back to us, checking every day, and also to try and explain the curation to them. Um, what else have we been thinking about? So, we, it's like we, a, we, so it's like one story on the carousel. Yeah. So of the eight stories, it's like here's an interview with somebody who wrote one of the stories we linked to earlier this week. And it's, right. like, a ri it's like a written interview, not like a video interview yeah. or anything like yeah. that. Yeah, it'll be written, but it could equally be a video. Um, and, it, it, you know, we are definitely thinking about um, recorded versions. Uh, a lot of people have told us they want audio versions. I'm slightly skeptical about audio versions personally. You know, I've tried to listen to reporters reading out their stories or even actors reading out their stories and Audem and, and there's, there, there's a version here in the UK called Curio, and which I think the Financial Times has a partnership with already. I sort of feel like um, you can tell that they're stories that were written rather than written to a, written to be uh, spoken, as it were. Like there's a, there's an art of radio that we kind of need to discover uh, as a sort of industry as a newspaper. So I'm not sure about it, but a lot of people say they want it, and I can understand if you're commuting, you might want to listen to something. So I think we might play around with that. The other thing we can do, of course, is localization and translation, right? We've only got eight stories a day. Those eight stories could be translated into German or Spanish or you know different languages. Um, we are thinking, one of the things that I did think about, which we haven't done yet, was how do we give access to our journalists on a big story, right? So, you know, we have this incredible resource. Um, of course, we do Twitter spaces and we do, um, you know, we used to do Facebook Lives back when that was a thing. But is there is there a forum where we could do that, whether that's, you know, on platform or off platform? Um, you know, do we set up, um, 
you know, a Reddit thread or a Discord or something where, you know, we can say, look, here's access to people. We want to answer your questions. What questions do you have? Um, I think that the, the, the possibly the difference between the audience for this app and the main FT audience, mm-hmm. the main FT audience are very, very sophisticated, right? They have, they have, and we assume quite a high level of knowledge and understanding, particularly of finance, but, but you know, of a lot of different things. We, you know, we, we write to quite a high level. I don't think that's a given with this adjacent audience. I think this audience is probably for our app is probably a bit younger and we could also, and, and you know, so we, we can, I think, meet them uh, slightly closer to them, uh, as it were. Um, so we're thinking about ways to do that as well. What about like pulling in all your free podcasts that you're already producing into the app? Um, we are already pulling in some podcasts into the app. We're just mm-hmm. looking to see how many of them are being listened to. Interesting. Okay. And then so for the U.S. edition, which as of right now hasn't launched yet, but are you planning to have like a U.S. editor who is trying to figure out what are the stories? That, like what's the difference between what will be the difference between the U.S. edition and the U.K. edition? So, um, yes, in short, we, you know, uh, we already have a U.S. operation at the FT, right? So we have a big hub in New York. We've got bureaus across the U.S., we have a large staff there. Um, you know, I sort of feel like it's very difficult for me to try and be in tune with the US and pick stories for that audience. It would be much better if it was done um, by someone who was, you know, very familiar with the US audience and understood it uh, better than I do. So that's definitely the ambition. It will be, it may also be subtly different from the UK edition in that the audience may have different needs. I think that. One of, the, one of the bits of research we've done is, of course, lots of people in the U.S. have picked up our app and said, wow, I did not expect this, any of this, from the Financial Times. Right? I expected finance from the Financial Times. I expected you know, macroeconomics from the Financial Times. I didn't expect um, you know, uh, reviews of Broadway shows or you know, thoughtful essays about food. Uh, or you know, or you know, a lot of the global reporting we're doing, or indeed a lot of the local U.S. reporting we're doing, they didn't expect it. Now that's great because they're discovering something new about us, but it also means that I kind of feel like we need to meet their expectations a little bit more in the U.S. So I think we probably need to have more of our core business coverage in the U.S., which again is hopefully a differentiator for us. I mean, essentially, our differentiators are. We are going to be writing about U.S. news, but with a global perspective. And we're going to be writing about global news with a U.S. perspective. And we're going to be writing about global business news, which hopefully, you know, there's a niche there for us. And I know it's a moving target, but uh, it seems like the launch of the U.S. version is coming sometime in early 2023. Yeah, that's right. Um, we are just um, putting the finishing touches to it to make it as good as it can possibly be, and we're very excited about it. And then, and then we hope for a we're hoping for a launch in, in very early 2023. And anybody listening now, to, regardless of where they are, if they have an iPhone, they can go into the I, the iOS store, search for FT Edit, and download the app and see the UK version. That's right. Um, and actually, they may see a little uh, embryonic US version as well. Awesome. Um, but it will get better from beginning of 2023. Well, Malcolm, those were all the questions I have for you. Where can people find you online? Uh, where can I? Well, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. I have a Twitter handle. Uh, my handle is Malcolm Moore. Um, where else? Uh, that's, pr- that's probably the best place, right? Yeah, probably, unless you're very active on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not very active on LinkedIn. Okay. But I do have a LinkedIn profile. Okay, well, Google him and follow him on Twitter if you're listening to this. Well, thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, Simon.